Uh, I would like to now uh, um, introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Joseph DeSimone, who uh, Aruna just mentioned. Joe received a bachelor's in chemistry from Ursinia's College and a PhD in also in chemistry from Virginia Polytechnic Institute, and then began uh, an exceptionally successful career at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he was eventually named eminent professor of chemistry. <clears throat> he is especially known for his work in polymer science uh, and its applications to human health. He has over 370 publications, uh, and those have been cited more than 42,000 times and uh, over 200 issued US patents. He is one of the rare individuals who is a member of all three national academies, National Academy of Sciences, Academy of Engineering and of Medicine. And it, in addition, received a National Medal of Technology and Innovation presented to him by President Obama in 2016. As Aruna mentioned, uh, Joe was recruited to Stanford by Sam in 2020 and is the inaugural recipient of the Sanjeev Sam Gambier Professor in Translational Medicine, uh, where he's a faculty in the Department of Radiology, Chemical Engineering, and by courtesy in the Graduate School of Business. Uh, Joe, the podium is yours. Great, uh, Norbert, uh, thank you. I, I assume my audios, everyone can see my slides? Okay, uh, first of all, it's, um, it's an honor and privilege to be here and uh, what a special uh, introduction and, and set of comments from Aruna. It was really nice to, to hear her and uh, to reflect and I love the, the metaphor about uh, students and trainees being uh, like a candle. And Sam really lived his life um, a focus on his on his trainees, and and I've seen it firsthand as I as I gener as I, as I moved to Stanford here and and moved into the lab space that Sam uh, had. Uh, it's really an honor and privilege, and frankly, a feeling of inadequacy uh, to be holding uh, professorship in in his honor. Uh, Sam was a good friend. Um, he was always there to help. Uh, everybody. We had a health scare in our family shortly after Milan uh, passed away and Sam jumped in and, and helped us out. It was really amazing. You know, one um, assesses universities uh, based on their points of excellence. And, um, you know, at Stanford, and more than the average, and, you know, the average here at Stanford is, is extraordinarily high, but even in, with that high average, Sam was really distinguished, uh, not only for his scholarship, but for his humanity. And uh, we see it every day still. So it's in that perspective um, <clears throat> that, you know, I want to dedicate this presentation uh, lecture with uh, Sam's memory. I got to know Sam as a leader of one of the centers for cancer nanotechnology excellence, uh, an amazing uh, center uh, here at, at Stanford. Uh, it, was a, it was a center that um, uh, complemented um, uh, the one we had at, at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, which was focused on uh, drug delivery and vaccine uh, design and delivery. And Sam's was on early detection. And, you know, he really stood out for the national network of uh, cancer centers and, and I always uh, reveled in, in his leadership. I mean, he kept the whole program going in so many different ways and knew how to position the whole, the whole network nationally and, uh, and really made a big impact. And for that, you know, all of us are, are very grateful. Um, in that, you know, I think it's a testimony to Sam to think about all the people that are joining us today, uh, both at Stanford and beyond nationally and internationally. And it's really a, a testimony to his legacy to uh, see everybody here. And, and again, I want to welcome everyone and, uh, as well and, and thank you all for, for your participation. So a little bit of perspective uh, and really set the stage for my career. In my PhD work a long time ago at Virginia Tech, as, as was mentioned, was focused on polymer science. My whole program is focused on polymer science. And you know, part of that for me was doing a PhD in the area of lithography, which is used to define structures uh, on integrated circuits. And we published this paper a few years after my PhD, after I already got to UNC. But we were making things on a couple hundred nanometer scale uh, using the tools of the microelectronics industry to do that. And it quickly started to dawn on me and, and many others that this length scale of the microelectronics industry 
uh, was really starting to get into the realm of what's interesting in biology beyond the length scales of cells in the, in, in the tens of nanometers or tens of microns or so, bacteria and microns, single digit microns, and, but not quite where viruses are, at, you know, sub, sub 100 nanometers, at least where my PhD was. And, but you know, as Moore's law really started to take off and continues to take off and driving the length scale of transistors, the minimum length scale down to what's relevant in, in biology. And what you really see is this, <clears throat> this convergence uh, of microtechnology from the semiconductor industry driving down to a length scale now in the single digit nanometers with EUV extreme ultraviolet lithography and the assembly of molecules from the bottom up. And it's in this milieu of in between that we really became fascinated with, you know, manufacturing and fabrication and application of life sciences. And so what I'd like to share with you is a little bit of a story where we're, we're developing digital fabrication techniques and their application in, in medicine. And I wanna start with um, a story related to uh, lithographic techniques to make precision particles of controlled size and shape and how one scales those up. And then taking advantage of other digitally designed approaches for fabricating things at even a, a length scale that's hard to access. And that's in between uh, macroscopic molding and the lithographic uh, world and entering the world of, of 3D printing or, or uh, digitally designed and fabricated structures. So the first one is, you know, can we take the tools of the microelectronics industry, the lithographic tools that defines every integrated circuit uh, that's just revolutionized the planet, and can we use those to make uh, drug delivery vectors or particles uh, yeah, that would be useful in medicine? And our approach was to take a lithographically defined uh, wafer uh, with features that were, you know, uh, tens of nanometers uh, even, uh, up to uh, single digit or tens of microns. And then we would take those silicon wafers and we would pour a liquid fluoropolymer that was photochemically curable on top of it. It would, it would wet every nook and cranny of these wafers and we could photochemically cure it and make reams of these films, large length scales of these films. And what we would do is we would bring this film that's patterned in contact with another film that we spread a liquid shown here in red that would become the precursor to a particle. And through a roll to roll process through a nip, we would be able to transfer this red liquid from this one film into the cavities of the other film shown in green without wetting the land area between the two. Kind of like an ice cube tray on the nanoscale or the micro scale. <clears throat> Once this red liquid would solidify either through chemical means or just cooling, uh, we had particles that were distributed spatially and then we could bring that film in contact with another film shown in yellow that has an adhesive on it, <clears throat> pull all those particles out, dissolve away the adhesive, and we'd have a colloidal dispersion of a precision particle made from the lithographic uh, approaches. And so with this, <clears throat> we actually you know, scaled it up. And you know, this is part of the translational aspect that a lot of us do here. And you know, the idea that one could take films, literally thousands of linear feet of film, uh, and use this to scale up these two-dimensional arrays of particles so you can collect them uh, to do applications. And this set the stage for us being able to ask questions that we couldn't ask without the ability of scaling. I'm a big believer in translational research, but we were able to make all sorts of particles of a wide range of characteristics. Uh, you can see these uh, defined shape particles, uh, even uh, not only uh, in, in controlled shapes, but also in controlled chemical compositions. And even we figured out ways to spatially control the chemistry within particles to make chemically heterogeneous uh, systems, not only with two different kinds of chemistries, but even three different kinds of chemistries. And so to me, this was a, a, a particle platform that allowed us to control fundamentals of particles that range from size and shape, but also give us exquisite control of chemistry. Uh, the chemical composition and that's the surface functionality and the mechanics uh, of these particles. And so some of the things that <clears throat> we explored, my students explored these candles of light that Sam referred to, uh, some work from Tim Merkel involved making replicas of red blood cells. You know, these are not red blood cells, these are hydrogel particles that we molded that would have the, the, the concave uh, uh, shapes of red blood cells 
but we were interested in uh, the circulation time. You know, it was well known that you don't put large particles in, in intravenously in, into animals because they would aggregate in the lungs. But you know, here's an example, a red blood cell that is eight microns, uh, seven microns in, in mice, eight microns in humans, but circulated for long periods of time. And the key is that old red blood cells, when they get old, they get stiff. But when they're young, they're mechanically deformable. And we varied the modulus of these cells and we could show that when they're stiff, they would aggregate in the lungs. And when they didn't, when they were soft and deformable, they wouldn't uh, aggregate. And we had circulation profiles in the days, uh, which would really unheard of for micron sized particles. Well, we could also tune the chemistry of these particles. We designed new chemistries that were acid labile. And we did a lot of in vitro and in vivo studies where you could take particles and our particles were easy to see because they had unusual shapes. You could dose them on the cells, you could watch the kinetics of uptake. And once they got inside the intracellular environment, uh, which was more acidic, we could watch the particles very systematically begin to swell and ultimately dissolve releasing their carbon. And so again, with the ability of tuning the chemistry, uh, we could release cargos. And some of the big, uh, big focus for us was, could we use these particles of a wide range of sizes and shapes? Could we do a foot pad injection? Could we watch their drainage to the draining lymph nodes? We could watch them populate the lymph nodes and the geminal centers. And depending on the size and shape of the particles and the cargo, these became very effective vaccines. And, I like to think that a lot of the work that uh, we and many, many others did uh, set the stage for uh, the particle delivery of the mRNA. And here's some uh, self-amplifying RNA work that we did for delivering particles uh, to cells. Now, part of these particles also became the, the, the role of uh, more effective chemotherapy. And so the idea is that we could dissolve a, poly a drug into a polymer matrix, watch it slowly dissolve or, or elute the cargo. Bob Langer at MIT really pioneered a lot of this work. Think about the gliadal wafer and, and brain cancer. But we take these nanoparticles that are sub 100 nanometers, 89 nanometer diameter, and we could dissolve docetaxel into this polymer and watch it get released over time. And so the idea is we can compare an intravenous delivery of pure drug, which gets cleared very quickly. But if we put that drug in a nanoparticle, we could extend the concentration of the drug in circulation for much longer periods of time and that became an effective improvement of the therapy of this known cargo. And so we had much better outcomes and survival uh, when we could increase the, the, the concentration and circulation over long periods of time in a couple of different animal models. And so here's an example where, you know, Richard Feynman and all his work, uh, where he said there's plenty of room at the bottom in sort of the nano world, was enabled by the microelectronics breakthroughs and Morse law, basically, that kept driving it. So, but what's interesting is how do we deal with things at, you know, tens of microns and higher and how, how do people make things? Well, they're mold things. Molding is, a, is an archaic approach, but most of what we deal with in everyday life is molded. Uh, injection molding tool shown here. Uh, these things are, uh, this is a massive industry. <coughs> um, there's a huge investment in time and money to make molded or, or these injection molding tools to make products. It takes a long time. Uh, and once you have them, you don't want to change them out. So it's a barrier to innovation. And you can really only mold simple geometries. There's a lot of geometries you can't mold. And in many ways, this slows down innovation because you spend so much time getting this, it's hard to innovate in a rapid uh, way. And it's not very useful uh, on a from one micron uh, 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 and higher. It's really a gap in capability. And in many ways, my perspective, many others' perspective, is that molding lacks the eloquence and versati versatility of self-assembly. And we were interested, can we replace <clears throat> uh, molding with a crafted by light approach that's driven uh, the microelectronics industry over the last 50 years? But we'd have to take it from a 2D to a 3D uh, perspective. And and that really drove us to develop new approaches for 3D printing, <clears throat> excuse me, and including approaches that would actually be scalable. Uh, there's one thing, you know, 3D printing has mostly been a prototyping world and we wanted to harness the ability of doing uh, scaling. And so we developed, developed a process uh, that uses light, pattern light, just like Moore's law, but we're gonna do it in three dimensions instead of just layer by layer. And the idea is we have a very special window at the bottom of a liquid reservoir that was not only transparent to light, but was also permeable to oxygen. 
And so what would happen is that we could uh, use light and you'll see this platform lowering into a reservoir of liquid with a very special window in the bottom. And then we would project a two dimensional image in the form of a movie. Uh, and so as you play these frames quickly, you're basically playing a movie and we're doing a choreography uh, with the light, with the Z axis, as we pull these objects up out of this reservoir and we're making very complicated structures without a mold. Uh, and in fact, we're making things that are unmoldable uh, that you couldn't make, you wouldn't have the symmetry to get out of the mold. Uh, this object's actually an unmoldable object. And so because of its symmetry and patterns as one part, we're able to make very complicated uh, structures. And so it's really a tool to allow designers to make things. And we've mapped out the details of the process. This is something called optical coherence tomography as we watch these particles or these objects being drawn up uh, out of the liquid reservoir, creating this dead zone. And it's really a revolution in 3D printing that allows it to go 25 to 100, even a thousand times faster. Uh, and it really opens up the design space. And so with that, you can pull together these kinds of products. We spun out a company called Carbon uh, that's making these kinds of products and commercializing multiple different areas in industry and really taking 3D printing for the first time from a prototyping world to a manufacturing world. And so we're very interested in the opportunities of the digital manufacturing and health and all sorts of opportunities associated with that. Let me give you some examples. One is a collaboration with our colleagues uh, at UCSF and UC Berkeley uh, Stephen Hatz and Natasha Balsera. And what they wanted to do was basically look at the advantage of chemotherapy, uh, but the problem with the systemic side effects, can we do local delivery uh, and facilitate and minimize the, the, the systemic effects? And so the idea is that we have a chemo sponge that we 3D print so that downstream from a tumor, we could, we could load through an intravenous delivery, lots of drug in, the con in solution into, into an IV let it accumulate in the tumor, but anything that left the tumor, we could, we could scarf up in these sponges and allow one to do better local delivery and semis, instead of systemic exposure. Again, enabled by geometries that are unmoldable in these kinds of approaches. In another example with a colleague, Andy Wong uh, from UNC, Andy is a, a prostate cancer uh, physician. We wanted to improve the uh, the approach for uh, uh, brachytherapy treatment where you had these radioactive seeds. And the whole idea is, could we take advantage of the spacers to improve the clinical outcomes? And in this particular case, could we improve the therapeutic index of brachytherapy by now having spacers that would have drugs like docetaxel in them, uh, but also had things like dexamethasone to reduce some of the side effects. And can we make high surface area structures uh, formulated with these drugs and we had tremendous improvements in brachytherapy by combining therapeutics and uh, dexamethasone uh, in the space or along with these radioactive seeds. So again, enhancement of, of therapy. In pancreatic cancer, uh, the opportunities for local delivery, because this is a cancer that uh, is not well vascularized. Uh, these tumors are known to have a high hydrostatic pressure uh, and uh, they're, 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 it's not accessible to a lot of intravenous uh, delivery of drugs. It's a drug delivery problem. Uh, these tumors are, cells are, are loaded up in the stroma. Uh, and, um, and what we did is we developed a device uh, that allows us to uh, locally deliver uh, drugs using iontophoresis. And so designing innovative devices using fabrication techniques like 3D printing uh, allows us to do local delivery uh, using a mild electric current. And we had tremendous uh, progress uh, by uh, locally delivering these drugs using iontophoresis. And we compare the amount of drug um, delivered via uh, intravenous delivery versus that delivered by uh, the device. And what you see is when you do intravenous delivery shown here in this red color, you have a lot of drug in, in plasma, but very little drug in the tumor. But when you do local delivery, we have a huge amount of the drug delivered locally, as you'd expect, and actually very little systemically. And this resulted in a significant debulking uh, of these tumors that were locally advanced. And what we're trying to do is render more people el eligible for surgery uh, by taking advantage of the local delivery and debulking tumors away from precious blood vessels uh, that allow surgeons to have a, 
uh, a better opportunity for, for uh, treating these patients. <clears throat> and so we think it's not only gemcitabine, but a whole host of different drugs, highly toxic drugs that would benefit from a local delivery approach rather than a systemic uh, delivery approach. And we think a lot of different indications would be relevant uh, here. Finally, let me end on a, <clears throat> another variety of devices that we digitally print. And all of us, I suspect, are vaccinated by now. And um, when you think about vaccinations and, and uh, I got the Pfizer vaccine, I know a lot of us got Moderna and others. You know, what's interesting is the target immune cells through this intravenous or through this intramuscular injection, we have way more immune cells in our dermis than we do in our muscle. In fact, it's, an, it's two or three orders of magnitude more immune cells in the dermis than we do in muscle. And these are actually really the target cells. And the idea that one could do local delivery to have a better effect. And so this is uh, an area that people have been looking at microneedles for a long time for more effective delivery of vaccines and other products. Uh, Mark Prowson at Georgia Tech has been a pioneer. A lot of these are using the tools of the electronics industry out of silicon and metals uh, or molding approaches for making microneedles. And there's a lot of different kinds of microneedles you'd like to access that would be hard to make in a silicon fab, uh, including uh, plastic-based microneedles that could be easily coated with controlled surface area. So you can do just, you know, really a, just a disposable microneedle with uh, coating being delivered to the dermis or hollow microneedles or even dissolving microneedles. And so we pushed the limits of resolution of our 3D printing approach, made a printer with really small pixels so that we could access microneedles out of a wide range of geometries that arguably you couldn't even make in a fab because they had undercuts or different heights. Uh, we made hollow microneedles. Uh, we're very excited about, we're making these now. And we're making these microneedles out of a wide range of, of chemistries, including hydrogels, biodegradable systems, water-soluble systems. And with some of my students at UNC, we were interested in controlling the dissolution kinetics of these microneedles for controlled local delivery. And so these are some uh, water-soluble materials at different dissolution times so that we can look at dose plus boost-like approaches for local delivery and making needles that have a wide range of latitude for doing this. And so here's some examples of a solid microneedle that we would dip coat in vaccines of different types here, OVA and CPG and antigen and adjuvant for controlled studies. And we would, store, we would lock these in as a film like in sugar. And with that, they should be shelf stable, maybe avoid some of the cold chain issues for long periods of time. And we find uh, through detailed studies, just like we did with particles, but now with the microneedles, that we can control the vaccine kinetics and we can get 50 times more antibody response by delivering to the dermis than one does for subcutaneous uh, injections. And we have a more balanced Th1, Th2 response uh, that you can see a dramatic difference between microneedles and subcutaneous for IgG2 versus IgG1 and it opens up huge opportunities for dose sparing. So we're big believers in local delivery uh, to the dermis. We're working with Peter Kim now with, uh, with the coronavirus uh, spike protein uh, systems uh, he developed with ferritin. And we have tremendous data and almost really saturated antibody response for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccines that, that Peter's lab is developing. So where do we go from here? And let me just wrap up. You know, we're inspired every day by Sam. Um, you know, some quotes here from Sam, you know, our victories will not come from therapies, they will come from earlier disease detection. Many of the big wins will come from the science and understanding of transitions from health to illness. And the healthcare system should be celebrating keeping people healthy. You know, really words to, to live by and guiding our interests. So we're looking at things like microneedles for uh, cancer vaccines. Uh, more effective ways, maybe could we replace, replace CAR T without uh, using, using microneedles without replacing um, uh, pulling out the cells. And then the one area I'm really excited about uh, with a lot of new colleagues here is everyone's focused on syringes and, and blood as a mechanism for monitoring human health. And I fully appreciate that. It's the way to do it. But you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity for interstitial fluid, not only for delivery, but also for health monitoring. And and uh, we're putting together an amazing team. This is some work from uh, Avi Fakar, somebody that Sam recruited here as an interventional radiologist. You know, the lymphatic system is sort of the third forgotten system, uh, third circulation system, in, in addition to venous and arterial. And we're looking at this in a broad way 
for health monitoring and local delivery. And, and uh, all of us here were all recruited by Sam. We're inspired by his vision for um, wellness monitoring. Uh, and uh, we're developing new approaches for doing that. And uh, we're very excited about this new frontier. So thrilled to be at Stanford, an amazing group of uh, new students and postdocs. And, and just uh, I'm inspired every day by these, uh, these lit candles and want to keep them burning. And um, we believe strongly in the value of uh, the, the, a lot of the things that Sam has espoused uh, in our lab. And this, you can see this on our website about the values that we believe in mostly so that we can be a destination for excellence uh, for everybody uh, around the world. And with that, I want to thank you all. And, and it's really a, a drop the mic moment uh, when Gary announced uh, the new cyclotron here at, at Stanford. And we look forward to everybody joining us. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Joe, for uh, uh, your accept that exceptional presentation. It really is reminiscent of Sam in the sense that some of the things that you talk about at first glance seemed like science fiction, yet you've made them reality. Uh, uh, and Sam did that so many times during his career as well. Thank you so much, that's uh, wonderful. Thank you. Norman.